station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Challenger Learning Center International Conference. This is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Hey, station. It's Mark here in San Antonio and a whole group of enthusiastic Challenger Center people. How do you guys hear? Hey, we, uh, we have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Hey, Scott, thanks for doing this in the airlock so people can see the suits. Chell, how are you? All right. Hey, we're so, doing great. And, uh, All right. Okay, Scott, so we've got some questions down here. I've got 12 or 14 or so. I know we have a very limited amount of time, so I kind of want to get right into the questions. But first of all, tell us if you've seen any meteors. I know that meteor shower was supposed to be peaking here last night. Well, I've been looking. You know, I think I may have seen one and got a picture of it, but uh, I wasn't absolutely certain. So uh, we're going to keep looking for them, and hopefully we'll see something, uh, something tonight. All right, and then tell us what you got next to us there floating in front of Chell. This is, this is our, our, our pet Skittles. There's a bunch of Skittles in here, and it just kind of sometimes floats around the space station. Well, at least you don't have to feed it. <laughs> Take it for a walk. All right, so I'm going to get Sarah. Uh, it's going to Sarah McLean, who's 15 years old, is going to come up to the mic. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Sarah. Um, my question is, when did you know that you wanted to be an astronaut, and is there anyone or anything along the way that helped inspire you or helped you reach your goal? You know, for me, um, you know, when I was young in, uh, in elementary school, I remember uh, I was talking to a, a, one of my classmates asked me what I wanted to do when I grow up, and I don't remember what I said, but he said that he wanted to be an astronaut, and that was kind of the first time I thought about it, and I said, you know, maybe I'll be an astronaut too, and he said, uh, no, you can't be an astronaut. I'm going to be an astronaut. That wasn't my brother, but it was a uh, another another uh, friend and that kind of you know got me thinking and then you know, it was just one thing I thought all along my uh, you know my whole life growing up and uh, you know I'm very fortunate to be in this uh, position now and be able to do this uh, great job and Scott this is Irene Poro hi um, many astronauts have reported that seeing the Earth from space and in space can be a profound experience. The shift has been uh, now called the overview effect. Could you comment on your experience in this regard, and especially having been in orbit for months or soon for a year, is a different experience than shorter mission? Thanks. Well, you never tire of looking at the Earth. I mean, it's a um, you know incredibly beautiful planet, and the things that are striking about it, besides its uh, its beauty, of course, is that when you when you look at the Earth um, from our perspective, you don't see any political borders. You see only uh, natural borders. You know, in some cases, those natural borders separate countries, but by and large, it uh, gives us the impression that we're all citizens of planet Earth, which we are, and not you know, particular, any particular country. So it, it kind of gives you a sense of more, uh, you know, unity on Earth and, you know, how all, we're all in this uh, situation of life together. And the other thing you notice is the atmosphere is incredibly, uh, incredibly thin. And you also know, notice some of the countries that pollute it greatly, like there's certain parts of Asia that will fly over that, uh, you know, is it's always cloudy and hard to see the ground. And, uh, and those aren't clouds, so it gives you a sense for, you know, how we need to take care of our environment better because it is very fragile. The atmosphere looks like a, a thin film over the surface. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Sherry Barrera, middle school science teacher. Uh, my question is, due to the physiological and psychological changes you have encountered in space, do you dream differently than when on Earth? Thank you for the, the question, Sherry. And we certainly do have uh, a number of physiological and uh, psychological changes that I think uh, that occur over the time that we're in space. Um, I've found that I sleep very well up here and I don't really dream any differently. Um, the thing that I do discover uh, specifically about sleeping is that uh, when the lights are off and when I wake up in the morning, when the alarm goes off, um, sometimes I feel like I'm upside down or I feel like I'm hanging from the ceiling and it takes a little bit of time. To, I have to turn the lights on to really kind of orient myself to where I am uh, in my crew quarters. Good morning. I'm Federico Zaragoza. Greetings from San Antonio, Texas. What are the most common misconceptions about living on the International Space Station? You know, that's a, that's a really uh, difficult question uh, for me to answer. I've never been asked that question before, and most questions that I'm asked, I've been asked before, so I, I congratulate you uh, for coming up with a good one. Um, you know, I don't really know what the public's perception of life is up here, but uh, what I can say is that we work really hard. You know, we work from the time we get up until basically to maybe an hour or two before we go to go to bed. There's a lot of overhead that uh, goes along with living and working in, in space and taking care of this space station uh, that people you know, don't recognize. It is uh, somewhat of a harsh environment to live in. You know, for instance, we don't have running water, so we can't, uh, you know, take a shower. Um, you know, we just take sponge baths, and, uh, you know, after a while, that gets uh, it gets a little bit old, but it's also at the same time, you know, it's surprising what you can get used to. And the fact that everything floats like Skittles here makes it, uh, you know, makes it hard to do things. Things become, uh, you know, very difficult to, you know, what might be considered a simple task takes a lot more effort because of, you know, you can't put anything down. Hello, my name is Justin Hutchison. I'm 11 years old, and my question is, what are the challenges of exercising in microgravity? Hey, Justin, that's a great question, and we have some very smart people on the ground, some engineers that develop the exercise equipment for us to use up here. Exercise is incredibly important to keep our bodies healthy and strong so that we're ready, uh, that our bones are strong, that our muscles are strong when we return back to the Earth. And so we have a treadmill up here to exercise our hearts, to provide aerobic uh, exercise. And so we actually have to wear a harness to hold us down onto the treadmill while we're running. Otherwise, with the first step, we would go flying off. And then, of course, we do a resistance exercise too, exercise for our muscles, like lifting weights. But there's no weight in space because there's no, we don't feel gravity. And so we have a special, kind of a universal gym that uh, uses cylinders, evacuated cylinders, and these pistons pull against the, this vacuum in order to provide the resistance. And we can do all sorts of exercises, squats and, and uh, deadlifts and, and bench press, and all of these are very important for keeping us healthy. Good morning, my name is Becky, and I'm from Challenger in Indiana. And I'm wondering, and you touched on it a little bit, but about your sleep patterns on orbit, if they change because you're exercising more or less, if it's different because you're sleeping strapped to the wall, um, if you sleep as well as you do on Earth. You know, I, I've been part of this uh, sleep study, and I, I don't have my, my sleep watch on because actually a couple of days ago I lost it. It floated away, and I can't find it. But we're, they were going to get me a new one. Um, so I've been part of the sleep study since my first flight in 1999, and I think what, what uh, you know, the biggest piece of data is I... I sleep a little less here in space, you know, generally maybe about 20 minutes less than I, I get on Earth overall. Uh, sleeping can be difficult here because you're, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is you're used to your whole life sleeping with pressure on your body, whether it's, you know, the pressure of gravity or the pressure of the blanket, you know, that becomes very comfortable. The other reason why I think it's more difficult to sleep is because when you when you sleep on earth you uh you know you get in bed and you're you're assuming a position that's more comfortable than you're generally walking around or sitting position 
and it provides some relief and lets you, uh, you know, helps you fall asleep. Where here, what we kind of do is, you know, you get in your sleeping bag and then you just close your eyes, and the level of, you know, comfort level doesn't change. So I think it makes, um, you know, sleeping a little bit uh, more difficult, and uh, you know, just has feels a little bit more different. Hey, Scott, these next two guys are Matthew and Nicholas, 15 years old, twin brothers. Thanks. Um, how long did you have to prepare yourself physically and mentally to go into space for a year? You know, we have uh, our preparation for the flight is about a uh, little over two years of training. Um, you know, most of that is on systems and, you know, how to perform the procedures we we do up here and the experiments and things like that. You know, some of it's physical. And, uh, you know, the mental preparation, I think, is just, just you know, preparing myself for what it's going to be like to be here for so long. It, it was good that I had done a six-month flight previously, so I knew what to expect. Um, you know, however, as astronauts, you know, we're training all the time in, in various different ways. So uh, formally, probably about two and a half years informally, you know, a really long time, I guess, since, uh, since I joined the astronaut office in uh, 1996. Hi, and I'm, hi, I'm, I'm Nicholas. Um, was there anything you were totally unprepared for? Um, on this flight, not yet. You know, I'm coming up on the uh, the duration uh, of my last flight. So I think I've been here about 140 days. My last flight was 159. Um, you know, I can tell you I have a different feeling now. It doesn't feel, uh, although I feel like I've been here a long time and I'm going to be here even longer, uh, about another, you know, over over 200 days. I don't have the same uh, feeling of, uh, you know, fatigue and, and getting, uh, you know, getting to the end of this mission as I did at this uh, same point last time. And I think that's part of, you know, what your brother asked, the, the kind of the mental, you know, preparation and training for this. I recognize that I'm going to be here for a whole year. A year is a long time. So my, uh, my expectations are somewhat different. Hi, my name is Stacy Shrewsbury, and I'm asking this question on behalf of Susan Evans. We're from the Challenger Learning Center at Heartland Community College. What advice do you have for today's youth about choosing a career in STEM in a STEM field? Hi, Stacy. That's a that's a great question. You know, education in STEM is so important. Um, the science, technology. Uh, engineering, math, all of these things uh, really contribute really to what we've been able to create up here in the International Space Station, this amazing national laboratory um, that's uh, an international partnership. Um, but I think you really need to encourage kids to just pursue what it is that they're interested in. I think it's important to, to emphasize math and, and technology and, and uh, those sorts of things but to, to find something that they have a passion for and, uh, can, and can really dig into and um, that will provide something of interest and in a, in a career for them later on. Hello, my name is Tristan Garcia. My question is, with your experience so far in space, what advice would you give the astronauts leaving tomorrow if they're leaving tomorrow or next week? What I, the advice I would give to uh, to folks leaving on a trip to Mars is, you know, they really know how, have to know how the systems on the, the vehicle work. You know, there's a lot of maintenance we do here. And, uh, you know, even though these systems are generally pretty robust and, and work well, there are times when they're going to have to fix them. Uh, they're not going to have the same type of communication uh, that we have here uh, with the mission control centers around the world to help us. So they're going to have to live uh, much more in an autonomous way because of the time delays that are involved. And uh, it would be very impractical for us to do some of the repairs we do if we had to ask the ground a question and we wouldn't get the answer for, you know, 30 minutes, for example. So knowing how to fix the systems, knowing how the systems operate uh, would be a very uh, important piece of advice I would give to anyone leaving on a trip to Mars. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Cindy Glenn from um, NEISD a School District in San Antonio, and I teach technology. My question for you is, what kind of technology, like iPad, laptop, smartphone, do you use mostly on the ISS, and are there any differences from using them on Earth? Thanks, Cindy. We have uh, lots of technology up here, of course. Uh, we have laptops and computers all over the place that they're really our main interface with the systems here on the space station. We have tablet computers that we use as well. And, uh, and so we have technology throughout here that help us on a daily basis. I'd say a couple of the, the biggest differences that, um, compared to using them on Earth, uh, for one, anytime you're using a laptop, you have to secure yourself to the ground. Um, hook your feet under some, some uh, handrails. Otherwise, as soon as you start tapping on the keyboard, you're just gonna float away. Um, for the tablet, in order to change the orientation, you know, on the Earth, when you change the orientation, the, there are sensors inside it that automatically sense which way the, the tablet is facing, whether it's a portrait or a landscape. And I found up here, if I want to have a different orientation, I actually have to spin around and uh, try and generate some Gs on the tablet in order to, to make it change its orientation. Greetings, gentlemen. I first want to say thank you for this opportunity. We know you have a very busy schedule, and we really do appreciate you taking your time for doing this. My name is Michelle Rissi, and my question is, is if you could change one thing on the International Space Station of your experience, what would it be and why? I would have more people up here. You know, I'd like to have my family, friends, uh, my kids, you know, people to uh, uh, share this experience with. I'm actually very fortunate I can, you know, share it with my brother, although we've never been in space together. It's, it's great. It's, uh, you know, a real privilege having uh, him to, to talk about uh, this great experience and what it's like and, and share that with him. But, you know, having other people uh, to have the opportunity to come up here is something that, uh, that I would change. Like I said, it is a, it is a privilege to be able to do this. And, uh, you know, the more people that do it, the better. And I think that would be a, a great thing if we could change that. And hopefully we will someday, and uh, hopefully someday soon. Good morning, I'm Alyssa from the Challenger Learning Center in Paducah, Kentucky. And we just finished our first ever underwater ISS camp where they built a, um, a big size model as they would in the NBL. So what is the one thing you believe we should absolutely be teaching our students about the ISS? Well, I think uh, it's one of the things that, that we learn up here that this kind of endeavor is not something that uh, one person can do, can do on their own, that just our team up here can do on its own. We have a, a huge network of support um, on the ground in countries all over the world. And the success that we have up here in the experiments that we do and the maintenance that we do um, and the construction that we've able, been able to do has come from teamwork. So I think taking um, that lesson and really employing that and, and, and having the students recognize how important it is to be able to work as a team, um, to have somebody that is able to leave, lead and somebody and, and folks that are able to follow effectively and communicate well together. You know, those are all lessons that we see every day here on the space station um, and in, in the human spaceflight program. Hi, I'm John from the Town of Ramapo Challenger Center in uh, Rockland County, New York. And my question is, what is the hardest thing to adjust to when flying in space? As the, uh, as the rookie, I'm going to answer that one because uh, it's still all very fresh for me. You know, I think the, the hardest thing for me is just keeping things organized. Every time I, uh, any time we get tools out to use, the, use tools or we take something apart, just keeping track of all the different pieces and not having them float away um, is incredibly difficult. And I've found that uh, you have to be very organized. Uh, you have to keep things in, in, in bags or taped to the wall to make sure that you don't lose pieces because you know, something that's floating in front of you, um, one minute, when you look away, it can be completely gone. And uh, so just learning how to, how to stay organized and be efficient has, has been a challenge for me.
Hey, Scott and Shell, thank you so much for doing this. Houston is telling us on this end that we are done. Uh, we we really, really appreciate you taking the opportunity, the time out of your day, uh, to answer all these great questions for the Challenger Learning Center. So thank you very much. And Scott, give me a call later. Hey, it was our pleasure. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. And thank you, Challenger Learning Center International Conference. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.